Thank you. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Following up on uh, Mr. Russell's um, question, so Jack Riley, uh, when he was chief of operations, but what, what does that mean, chief of operations? He would oversee our operations division. Well, I get that. Come on, put some meat on the bones. What? what uh, all, all of our enforcement priorities, which would include air wing and, and other areas. So were things going well with the air wing or not going well with the air wing? I, I'm not, I don't have personal knowledge, sir, of, of how things were or weren't working with the air wing at the time that he was the chief of operations. Well, I mean, we just detailed an $86 million boondoggle. A lot of this uh, responsibility goes to the Department of Defense. I, I, I did have a briefing on it, and I, I do buy that. But I'm just struggling to figure out how this person in 2015 got a $36,000 bonus. You know, the American people, we're $19 trillion in debt, and I'm sure he's a good, capable person. But it's just unimaginable that we can somehow justify handing out bonuses by the tens of thousands of dollars. I don't think the American people, the people we were hired to do this job for, I don't think they can look anybody in the eye and say, tell me why this person should have gotten a $36,000 bonus. Because I tell you what, most of the people in our districts, they aren't getting $36,000 bonuses. They may not be getting $3,600 in bonuses. So when you have a problem that's approaching $100 million and the thing is sitting in the hangar and you're the chief of operations, why should you get a $36,000 bonus? He then also got promoted, right? Now he's the acting dep uh, principal deputy administrator. So what, what do you tell the American people about that? I mean, sir, I, I obviously know Mr. Riley well. I think he's an honorable man. I don't know at what point this rose to his level, the issue with the air. He was chief of operations. Right. But I, again, I don't know at what point this came from our aviation division into the chief of operations. And, and If it didn't, that would be a problem, right? And that is possible, sir. How do you excuse yourself from this when? I, again, I, I don't have a sufficient answer for you. Uh, that's right. And, and, and I think that's a very candid answer. I think it's a very accurate answer. It's a question we're asking. And I, we got to figure out how to figure this out. Because this whole page of people are making tens of thousands of dollars in bonuses. And we have an Inspector General report come out. It's not too rosy. And it's just terribly frustrating. The two recommendations that are outstanding, Inspector General, can you please articulate the two recommendations that haven't been agreed to or implemented, and why is there a conflict? There were, um, in the report uh, that we received from um, DEA, um, they had made uh, some steps towards implementing some of the actions they had uh, presented to us. Explain uh, to me what the two are, and then maybe Mr. Patterson can say why the, DE, the DEA doesn't want to do that. Um, if you could give me one moment. Sure, sure. Sorry. Um, the, um, the two that um, we still have, um, we have as, by the way, resolved in that they have acknowledged the steps that they are going to take and need to take. So there's no outstanding. I, when I heard your testimony, I thought you said five of the seven had been implemented, but the remaining two, Correct. are they in the clear now? No. They're, they're the five are closed. What we do call resolved are um, when a component here, the DEA, um, agrees to take the steps right. we have Are there any outstanding take, issues? And there are some as to those. Um, and um, what they involve are um, the recommendations about the long-term confidential sources review. Mm -hmm. um, and they have taken some steps to implement policies that would ensure the long-term reviews. Um, the issue there that we have identified or, the, or what we are waiting to see is that, in fact, there is a clear system in place for the timely review of those. Because one of the concerns we found in the 2015 review, and that is what we are talking about right now, was the DEA was not following its own policy that then existed. It certainly was not complying with the AG guidelines that were in place. 
Um, and uh, it wasn't clear to us still that they had a, um, a measurable uh, timeline in place for how they were going to review long-term CIs and what the process okay. was. Okay. And the other issue? Um, the second one was um, in looking at the, the uh, FICA issue, the disability payment issue, to informants, which we had serious concerns about whether there was a legal basis to do that. We, uh, our recommendation was for the DEA to go back and evaluate whether there was a legal basis to do that. And our understanding is the DEA is still working on that issue. Can you, uh, Mr. So we Patterson, have can, you, can you illuminate us? My time has gone over here. But why is a confidential informant getting, getting benefits? It, so, absolutely, sir. On, on the FICA payments issue, uh, a policy has been posted in, in extraordinary circumstances where an informant is performing a role as an informant in doing government work. They may be entitled to Department of Labor uh, review for FICA payments. Um, How many people are we talking about? A handful. I mean, I don't think actually we've had any in the last number of years. Um, I think these go back some time. Um, the issues were that we did not have a policy in terms of you know what the employees would even know what had to be presented to the Department of Labor. That policy has been posted on our human resources site. Um, the issue related to uh, the question of the legality has been worked with the department. Um, we owe responses back, and I think it was essentially providing the proof of both of these things to the okay. IG. Thank you. My time has expired.